Okay, uh, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, I, again, I would like to thank the Weinbergs for um, hosting this, and I want to dedicate this class both to Greg's mother, who passed this year, right? You're still in, it's, you're still in the year of, uh, of a mourning. And I just learned, actually, that his mother-in-law, his father-in-law? Father. Father-in-law also just passed. What was his name? Um, Robert Stairs. Robert Stairs. Do you know yeah. his Hebrew name by any chance? I don't. Okay, it's good. It's all yeah. good. So we're dedicating... Shlomo. Can I add a name to that? Yeah, sure. Roger Berger. Roger Berger? Shlomo Ben Mordechai. Shlomo Ben Mordechai. Any other add-ons? I want to dedicate this class to the souls that, that passed. May their souls have an elevation. To this gentleman who needs a, uh, a healing. Roger Berger passed Ro a, uh, Oh, he passed. In Africa. So his neshama should have an aliyah, which means his soul should have an elevation. Yes, Mark. Add a simcha to the list. Add a simcha. Let's go for it. Chris is a new Jew. Chris is a, a new Jew, and he's changing his name to D Tola. What, what's the D Toledo? D Toledo. No, 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 no. no. Zalman. 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 Ben Zalman. Zalman Ben Avraham. I love it. Okay. Wow. Mazel tov. Mazel tov. Mazel tov. Okay. So. Uh, Tonight's class, the title, I'm just going to repeat the title and then we're going to jump in. And that is The Torah's Antidote to Aging. How to Stay Vibrant in Your Life. The Antidote to Aging. Now, what I'm, what I'm, not, going to, what I'm not going to suggest is that we're going to be here forever in our bodily forms. I'm not. But how do, how do you maintain a vital, vibrant life as your physical selves start to sort of like experience, what, you know, gravity. Gravity. Thank you for that. Gravity. So, so how do how do we how do we um, maintain vitality? And what I want to share with you are four energizing life energizing perspectives. Perspectives that I believe that if we are able to plug into them, that that will help us stay vital and vibrant to the degree that we, we can, regardless of our, our physical situation. And I'll tell you something, um, a, um, a perspective, perspective, or certain perspectives, can be life energizing. And if, you, and if you have, and if you don't have them, if you are saddled with um, anxiety, right, it sucks the life out of you. It affects your, we know this, it affects your physical health. There, you know, there is a, a absolutely a, a reciprocal relationship between physical health um, and spiritual slash emotional health. So I want to share with you four, what, I'm only sharing four, I'm not saying these are um, you know, uh, exhaustive, but four life energizing perspectives and then three practices. Because that's what the Torah is about. The Torah isn't about just sharing values. It's about offering actual practices that we can incorporate into our lives, right? That will take those perspectives and give and embody them and make them real. So they're not just up here. Let's start with the perspectives. So there's one, the first one uh, uh, actually is three. And it is, you find it in a prayer that is the first prayer um, in the sitter. It's the prayer that we, um, quite often, we teach our kids to recite. As the, uh, as the first prayer. And, um, but uh, for whatever reason, as we grow older, we, we no longer pay attention to this prayer. There's this song that, this, this melody that we're taught, um, that we sing it to, and I think we have an association, almost like a childish association with this prayer, and we don't appreciate, we can't possibly appreciate the amazing energizing perspectives that flow from this prayer. And imagine, this is setting the tone for the entire day. This is the first prayer, right, that, um, that we should say, that it, or it's suggested that we say 
every day. So it's setting the tone for the day. This is the prayer. Have you ever heard of Moda'ani? Yes. Of course. You know Moda'ani, right? Right. Do you say it every morning? Okay, we're going there. Okay? But we're, we're boldly going where no Moda'ani has gone before. Okay? So here's, so here's the prayer. Moda'ani lefanecha. I acknowledge before you, O God, Melachai v'kayam, shehechezarte bi nishmasi, that you returned my soul to me. We're just waking up. You returned my soul to me, shehechezarte bi nishmasi, bechemla, with, with, bechemla, with compassion. You returned my soul to me with compassion, Rabbi Munasecha. Great is your faith. That's the prayer. You wake up, that's what you say. Again, I acknowledge to you, O oh God, right? You return my neshama to me, you return my soul to me. Bechemla, with compassion, Rabbi Munasecha, great is your faith. Okay, there are three elements here that set the, that are foundational. If it's the first thing you're supposed to say, then it's setting the stage for the rest of your day. So the first thing is actually interesting. <coughs> Thank you for returning my soul to me. What does that mean? Deductively, what does that mean? Thank you. I woke up. What? I woke up. Well, yes, you woke up, but what? You didn't have your soul. You didn't have your soul when you slept. Where did it go? Where did it go? So we're not going to discuss sleep where, what? Sleep apnea. <laughs> Neshama apnea. No, it's neshama apnea. Where did it go? Uh, where did so? But what's clear, without discussing where the soul went, it's clear, right? That by by saying by thanking God for returning your soul, that while you were in suspended animation, while you were asleep, your soul wasn't with you, or certainly not fully with you, because God is now returning it. That's a very there 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 are there's something very powerful there. Let me ask you, why is that? What do you mean my soul wasn't with me? Forget about where did it go. What does that mean? What can we deduce from the fact that while we're asleep, that our soul is not with us, and it has to be returned? What can we deduce from that? We've lost some part of our humanity. You, consciousness. What? Consciousness lost some part of our humanity. What? Disconnected. Okay, these are all, okay, yeah. It, was, it, was, it left you for some purpose. Oh well, that's that's very interesting. Well, These three are all so low. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is that you wake up energized, right, for a new day. Yeah. And so something must have happened. I mean, sleep is there for I'm sure biological reasons, but, but also for spiritual reasons. Yeah, exactly. Oh, but what? So what you're saying then? Wow, one second, that's interesting. What you're saying is that we are actually by. We are energized because body, uh, but sleep energizes our body. What you're saying is when the soul leaves us, we're energized well, by the absence of the soul? No. no. Is that what you're saying? The root. Oh, in other words, so one of the things I've been studying with a, a, another rabbi recently. Are you seeing another rabbi? I am. What? <laughs> and, and wait, turn the camera. His perspective. Unbelievable. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I, knew, I had to tell you sometime. Okay, go, go, go. Well, go. don't worry. I, for the most part, and Gary. Are monogamous. <laughs> <laughs> We're chaperones. No, you're chaperones. Okay. Uh, anyway, so his perspective, but I would imagine yours too, is that Hashem has a, a, uh, a part in everything that happens. And so, in, in, in the world, all the time. I would and agree. And so, pardon me? Yeah, yeah, I'm with and you. So, uh, what I deduce, based on what you said, is that. The soul leaves, and something, Hashem has a hand in what happens to your soul at that time, during that time, and for a purpose, and then returns it to you when you wake up. Okay. So there's a purpose to removing the soul and then returning the soul. Obviously. Good. Great. The point I want to sort of like focus on, that was, that was a really good um, sort of like digression. Um, I, want to, I want to focus on uh, what, what the three of you were sort of like alluding to, I think. And that is... When we are asleep, when we are, when we are in a state, an unconscious state, where we are not making decisions, we're not out there in the world, we're not, our soul isn't animated. 
Our soul in, is not engaged. Our soul is there first and foremost to animate us in our lives as we move through our lives, as we, as we wrestle with our lives, as we encounter situations that demand us making very, very difficult decisions. You can't make any decisions while you're in an unconscious state. You're not competent. Any decision you make while you're in an unconscious state is not, uh, you know, is not, you can't, you don't. It's not, no, I'm only joking, you can't. So what this is stating is this, that the, the soul's purpose, the soul is there to animate our lives, our conscious lives, and to assist us and to guide us in those lives. It's not functioning if we're not in the trenches navigating our lives. Does that make sense? <clears throat> So that's point number one. That's point number one. That, that, the, that our, right at the beginning, right, we were placed here, we were placed here and the soul was implanted within us, right, to be in the trenches and to, and, and, and to wrestle with life and to live life and, to, and for our soul to be this in, internal beacon to help us navigate our lives. Okay. Would it be fair to say there's a connection between the soul and consciousness in, in not just the limited sense of being conscious or unconscious, but in the sense of being purposeful in everything you do? Absolutely. I think that's part and parcel of, of what we're talking about. That's point number one. Point number two, let's go to the second part. Bechemla, with compassion. He returned our soul to us with compassion. What's compassionate about that? He returned our soul to us. You took it, return it. We're told, you know, you take something, you return it. You borrow something, you wanted my soul, that's cool. I'm not doing anything. I'm just here. Take my soul, return it. What's compassionate about returning a soul? Why is that a compassionate act by God? The soul was, the, was a gift in the first place. G absolutely. Okay, and therefore? And therefore, it's only, it, the compassionate act is the, I gave you this, I'm going to appreciate it for a second, and then I'm going to give it back to you. Oh, okay, so what you're saying is the, the, the soul was a gift to begin with, right? So we should be appreciative of the gift, but th is that compassionate? It's not yours. The, the gift isn't exactly yours. It's something that's given to you with the responsibility to share it. Absolutely. I, I, I'm 100% with you. My question is 100% with you, and, and that's how we're going to get to that. Um, so, no, the compassion is that where's the compassion, though? It's, so it's, it, it's, it, what, see what, I love your point, but I don't think it answers this question. I'll tell you why. What are you getting right. At? Um, I, I think what your point uh, touches on, Hakara Satov, being gra grateful for something that you were given. That's different. So if it was talking about gratitude, yes, I would say that's, it, it, that idea is housed here. But now we're talking compassion. So even though your idea is a very legitimate idea, which we are going to talk about, I don't think, it's, I don't think you see it right here. I think you see it elsewhere. Well, the compassion is that the body suffers without the soul. So in returning oh, the soul to the body... Oh, that's a beautiful idea. Thank you for returning the soul to the body. Even though the body is in an unconscious state, a body without a soul... Right, is in, right. Can in a distress. Can I make it very simple? Please. Look at it from another place. Are you implying that it's the, not? The, the word, the, I don't know how they are in Hebrew, but this is returning the soul with compassion. Yes. Does that mean that compassion has been regenerated, has been increased, has been energized in that soul, and I am now giving it to you with a greater compassion than Oh, wow, that's beautiful. Ra uh, Ralph, that's very beautiful. Because there are two ways to look at that. There are two ways to look at it. You returned our soul. We are now, as a result of the soul being taken from us and then returned to us, we are now, we have a greater degree of compassion. That's what you're saying. That's a beautiful idea. Or it could be that the giving, the returning of the soul was a compassionate act. That was my question, but I love your idea. I love your idea. There's never, right? There's never just one idea. So what, what's the compassion here? It, not going with Ralph's idea, which is beautiful. Yes. Well, well, you're not you if you don't have your soul. And so it's compassionate to me. Oh, that's related. That's related. That's related to what you said. You're, 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 we're in a distressed, distressed state if we don't have our soul. So compassionately, it's compassionate. Okay. I also want to add to, the, to, uh, to these ideas one other idea, and that is... 
God sees everything. He knows what we did. He knows whether we've been naughty or nice, right? He knows everything, right? That we can't hide from God. And yet, and he took our soul from us, right? And yet he returned it. And there has to be a measure of compassion. He ha it is a compassionate act because he could easily say, you know what, I've given this man 37 years or 43 years, 65 years. He's not getting it right. He keeps on every day. And of course it's true. Every day, each and every one of us, each and every one of us, the greatest rabbis, trust me, walk through their day feeling that they're not coming close to realizing their potential. Each and every day, returning the soul is a compassion act. Does that trouble you? Good. I thought I was reading that. I was wrong. Yes. I, I, I was seeing where you were going. I was gonna... And you were nodding and you were, yeah. you were going there. So that's how it's a compassion act. We have to know that God is a compassionate God by virtue of the fact that he returned our soul to us, by virtue of the fact that he returns our soul every time we awaken from sleep. Even though we may or may not deserve it. Based on our actions, yes. Despite that's the point. Despite, despite, despite that. Humility. Yes. And there is humility there. Right, that's a side, we for sure. We acknowledge the humility is what we're saying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's, that's the effect of saying this, that you, you give it back with... You're, oh, you're humbled. You're humbled by the compassion. The, the fact that I'm saying that you've returned it with compassion means that I'm humbled by your gift. Yes. Right? And, that, and, and that actually leads into the last thing, Rabba Emunasecha. Great is your faith. Great is your faith. So... You returned it compassionately. Great is your faith. The very fact that, that we woke up, right? Nothing is promised. Nothing is guaranteed. Nothing. The very fact that we woke up is God's way of saying to us that he has faith in us and you're not done. The very fact that you wake up means that there is still some, you still have a... Um, a role to play in this world. If you didn't, you wouldn't. Every morning is, is an expression of faith by God that your life matters and continues to matter. Can you? This, yeah. this is a question for me, kind of, because like, when I was learning the prayer. Modani. Yeah. Um, I, you know, because the first two words are grammatically incorrect, right? They're backwards. Animode. It should seem. Animode, but we don't want the prayer to say to start with I. So. Okay. Modani, right? Okay. And so I thought that well, the whole rest of it is a little bit of a jumbling of words. And so in that line where it says, "How great is your faith?" Yeah. I always thought it really meant, "How great is my faith in you, in God?" But I'm hearing now for the first time, it's, "How great is your faith, God, in me?" Yeah. Well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, that's how, that's, how, that's how we're learning it. I didn't get that. Right. Until now. But you resonate with it? Now I do, yeah, thank Okay, you. good. Yes. So those three, first prayer, a simple prayer, a prayer we teach our kids, kid, you know, you sing it, you have this nice little jingle to it, right? And then when you get older, you focus on the more serious prayers. And legitimately, I mean, the Shema, the Shemona Esrei, other prayers. And we forget about Maudani. That sets the tone. By the way, just as an aside, and I'll come back to this later, that should be a practice. And we're going to talk more about, about that. Um, if, yes, Greg. Just continue on. Oh, okay. I'll in a second. Okay, so, though, so that's, those are the first three energizing perceptions, uh, uh, um, perspectives, that we, that we should start our day with. Okay? Do you want, you, you want, to, uh, you want to repeat them? Who wants to repeat them? Anyone? Okay, Mark, go. What are the three? Yeah, what, oh, oh, what, are three? The, what are the three? What are the three? Oh, I can. Re yes. This is the very reason why. Yeah. This is why we have this. Yes. I think you need more slivivits. So yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So number one is that God returned our uh, returned our souls. If He returned our souls, that in when we are in suspended animation, we're not out there in the world acting in the world. Our souls. The whole purpose of the soul is to guide us, to animate us in our lives and in our decisions. That's point number two. Uh, point number one. Chemla, compassion. That God operates with compassion. 
that despite, uh, despite the fact that we, you know, we don't come close to realizing our potential, every day he returns the soul, our soul to us. When we, and then the last point is, um, Rabba Amunasecha, great is your faith in me. The very fact that, we, that we're here, that we woke up this morning, right, is a testament to the fact that our, that our work is not done, that, we, that, that our, lives, our lives are significant. And I'll tell you something, you know, that resonates, uh, hopefully that resonates, but can you imagine someone who's, who's going through a really difficult physical or emotional, spiritual type of crisis to believe, because you know, we live in, you know, we live in a, 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 a society that, that talks about quality of life and what's the quality of life if I don't have a full range of motion? What's the quality of life with fill in the blank? You woke up, you woke up, you're contributing to the world. And dare I say, dare I say, someone in a coma who's still alive is still impacting the world, impacting those around him. Her, him, her, yes. So I'm the layman here as far as the religious aspect of this, but from a purely biological standpoint, is our soul in us when we're dreaming? Is that, because that impacts our decision. Oh, like or, or, dreams, we right. We think, we think about them, we try to make sense of them, and we're there. Well, you know, that's a really good question. How does, how does dreaming fit into this equation? Because you would think that that's sort of like a soul activity and not just a, a physiological activity. Breathing is a physiological activity. Dreaming is something else, right? We would agree a dream state is something else than just breathing and eating. And So where does dreaming, I, I, that's a good question. I have, to, I have to come back to you on that. Right, because if you took my soul, and yet this seems to be a soul type of activity, how is that? How is that? Um, do you have a memory it's the echo soul? of the soul. That's very poetic. Soul? That's very poetic. Do you have a memory without a soul, or do you? Must you have a soul to have a memory? Good. These are all great questions. Great questions, but we have to move on. Yeah. Yes. If I could just uh, reduce the ox to a bullion cube for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, so oh, I love that phrase. What's that? I love the phrase. Um, uh, so it, it would appear that, and of course, this is this is like it's is to regur to say that, that every day is a miracle. We, we wake up I know. And every day, every day is a miracle because what you said is that when we go to sleep, we don't know what's gonna happen. You know, our soul is, is, is out and, and this may be our last day. I mean, we just don't know, we just don't know. So every day you wake up and it's another miracle. Thank you for having uh, given me this day to express whatever, how, how, however I can express myself in the world. Yes, this is yes. Just, God only knows what's going on. Right. You know, there is a teaching, just as an aside, there, and maybe, maybe you, right, God does know. Um, maybe you've heard this before. Maybe, maybe I've, I've shared this. There's a teaching that says this. Do teshuva. Teshuva is the term for atonement, um, make amends, forgiveness, you know, a lot of, it, it take stock. Do, um, do teshuva the day before you die. That's what the teaching says. What's problematic with that? You don't know when you're going to die. No one knows. So do tshuva uh, every day. That's the point. That's the point. Be in a perpetual state of tshuva, of introspection, of evaluation, of correction, in a, in a, 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 on a daily basis, because you don't know. And be, and, part, and, and be part of family. Being, being, being well, yeah, you can across the board. Across the board, yes. This is like an auction, Todd. You scratch. You scratch. You, scratch. you by the way, you just sponsored this class. You just sponsored this class. TJ, yeah. without being tongue-in-cheek. Yeah. Without, tongue without being tongue-in-cheek. Anxiety-inducing. Anxiety-inducing what? Which part of it? To take stock every day oh. and to be conscious of your failings. He's, he's nodding off his head. Go, I mean, take, take. Why don't you? Oh, no. That's so much. My dad and I were having a conversation about this at dinner tonight. I was getting in my own way about something. And he said, well, you can't just be in fear of, uh, of admitting your faults. And one of the things that I learned from him and from my family that I pride myself on is the ability to say, you know what, you were wrong about that. Or this is something that you do on a daily basis that hurts to my kids all the time. I'm sure you do, you're a father, <laughs> as you should. But they're, you're talking about yourself. I'm talking about myself. Uh, so I think a, a huge part of Judaism is questioning and delving deeper and trying to find meaning in something. And a lot of times you're gonna find meaning in those faults. So if you're constantly- Oh, well that's a nice point, meaning, right. Wow. Yes, yeah. You, you it's part of- Search through your 
beautiful, beautiful. And again, we're not talking about, and I, I, just to address, we're not talking about walking around, right, completely weighted, weighted down by, oh my goodness, I'm not this perfect person. Judaism doesn't expect perfection. God doesn't expect perfection. There's, there is a, um, there's a, um, a beautiful um, verse that says, you know, um, I, you've probably heard me say this before, what is the difference? This is really, this is really, what is the difference between a tzaddik and a rasha? What is the difference between a righteous person and an evil person? Those are strong, that's strong language. Those are poles apart. What's the difference between a righteous person and, a, and an evil person? And it'll surprise you. Because in our minds, as I mentioned this, you probably you know, have a vision of what a, a, an evil person is and what a righteous person is and what qualities they each have. This is what the verse says. You know what, it, what, what it's a function of? It's a function of, well, it's a function, I, 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 maybe I'll elaborate on that. The righteous person falls down seven times, gets up seven times. The evil person falls down once. That's it. What does that mean? It means two things. What I pull out of it is two things. Number one, righteous people fall down all the time. You can't become righteous without doing it. You can't be become righteous without falling down, pulling yourself up, dusting yourself off, and continuing. That's how you become righteous, never stopping. An evil person falls down once and says, this is too difficult for me. It's too hard. It's not worth it. And once you give up, once you give up, once you stop believing in yourself, you're on the fast track. You're on a slippery slope, however you want to say it, towards, to, you know, towards things that would surprise you down the road. That's it. So yeah, we're not talking about walking around in this, in this uh, you know, uh, wearing this mask of, 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 of shame and blame and all that stuff and weighted down by that. But, uh, you know, but also to be man enough, right, to take a good look, a critical look at yourself. At the end of the day, there, were, there used to be, and I'm sure there still are people that at the end of the day, they do what is called a cheshbon nefesh, where they evaluate themselves that day. Every night. Can you imagine? And but some people actually write it in the journal. <laughs> some, people, some people write it in a journal, right. Okay, so that's perspective number one. Perspective number two, there are four of them. Well, those are three perspectives, but all that come flow from one prayer. Um, number two is, is there's an interesting phrase or, um, for long life in the Torah. It appears twice. And we're not going to focus on, on the two mitzvahs. I'll tell you what the two mitzvahs are. But we're not going to focus on those two mitzvahs right now because that's a class in and of itself, even though it's related. But they're twice where arichas yomim, long life, is promised. Whatever that means. Does it mean in this world? Does it mean in the world to come, right, after this life? But long life. You know what the term is? Arichas yomim, long days. You should have long days. When's the last time someone said, you should have long days? <laughs> he used that phrase? <laughs> she? So what's wrong with that phrase? What it should have said, seemingly, is you should have either many days or even more many years. That's what you say. You should live till 120. You should, be, you should live for many years. Why does it say, yamim? days, and long as opposed to many. And yet this is the phrase that refers to longevity, however you understand it. You should live fully. You should live fully. What, why do you say that? Every day. Live your days every day fully. Full, long days. We've all had days where that have been full and so satisfying. And you look back at some... lives 90 years right. and doesn't live any full days. Right live longer than they contributed anything. Beautiful, you anticipated. Short? Yes. No, I went to this class once before, and you, I listened to oh, it the oh, first time. Oh, okay. Jesus, this particular... No, you didn't get the Modani. You I mean no. this particular point. Yeah. Yes. You should live... So there's people who live fewer... Yes. ...but live... More, Fully. More, ...more full. So in other words, the function of long life is not how many years you've lived. It's how many days you've lived. That's how many full days you live. Full long days. days, long days. Haven't you had a day like at the end of the day, you look back at something you did at the beginning of the day, and you're surprised that it was the same day? It feels like it was another day. It was a different day because your day was so absolutely full. 
could that have been within Israel 12? Trip. Israel trip. Yeah, that's Israel like trip. Traveling. Yeah, that's, like. yeah, that's what so traveling is. Every day for eight days. Exactly. Right. So long our days, each and every day, should be long and full. Now the question then becomes, okay, thank you, Rabbi. That's great. What's the secret to having a full day? Feeling that way. But that's what's being conveyed in this, Arich HaSyamin. Number three, we are all, and this is going to touch on something that somebody said, and I already forgot who, um, that we were all created in the? Image of God. Beautiful, you've been reading. We've all been created in the image of God, but Selem Elohim Kidmuso, in the likeness of God. In the image of God, what does that mean to you? When you say that we were all created in the image of God, what are we talking about? <clears throat> well, obviously not the physical image. What, what are we talking about? God is Eastern, therefore you are holy. Oh, I'm holy, therefore you are holy. So in other words, we have the capacity for holiness. Yes. Good, beautiful, yes. The idea of image <coughs> implies reflection. Say the that again? The idea of image implies reflection. Oh, Elohim, yeah. The likeness of God. We can't be godly because we're human. If we all have a little slice of that in there. Oh. There you go. There's a little now slice. Now you're going. Now you're, now you're getting to where I want to go. Anyone else want to share? We, each and, uh, each and every one of us, each and every one of us, that, w what is a soul? Is a, it's described as sort of like a sliver of God. A sliver of God within each and every one of us. <laughs> we have been given this gift. Somebody said something about a gift. Was it you or well, about a gift? We've been given this gift, the neshama, the soul, this, ca this capacity for godliness, a capacity for godliness. Now, imagine the following. Somebody comes to you, gives you a beautiful gift. It's wrapped up, got a ribbon on it, beautiful. You thank him profusely, you take it, you put it on a shelf. You never open up the gift. Someone's given you a gift and you don't open it. The fact that each and every one of us were created in the image of God, were gifted the capacity, the possibility to experience God, to embody God, to emulate God. Capacity, I want to say it briefly and succinctly, capacity compels. When you have the capacity for something, for something, you are compelled to use it. Would you not agree? If, in fact, we had capacities, and if we have capacities and we don't explore them, and we don't use them, what a, sac what a sacrilege for ourselves. We have this part of us that we're not living. We have to know in the depth of our souls that we have capacities, divine capacities. And when I use the term divine capacities, we're talking about something that transcends our wildest imaginations. Have you ever had, have you ever been surprised by something that you did, like because you didn't realize that you had the strength to do it? Ever been in a situation where you can't, you, the only time you can experience that is if you are placed in a situation that demands it. You can't, you can't, uh-oh, uh-oh, Ralph, Something's troubling you. You are not placed in that situation. You have allowed yourself to be in that situation. Okay. You have an option. Okay. You have an option, A, to be there physically and or mentally and or emotionally. And the option to be present, that is to say, to recognize so any situation, however you got there, whether you allowed yourself or it was a situation or propelled yourself, or propelled yourself okay. however, so thank you for adding to it. How, however you got to that situation, you now have the capacity, right, to rise above that, to not allow that situation which, which could uh, crush you or, or bring out the worst in you, right? Um, not to surrender to those impulses. We have divine capacities to overcome. Divine, by definition, means to transcend, to go overcome, which w what, is, what is physical, because divine is sort of like eternal. So we have those capacities. Each and every one of us, we don't realize, and again, this is a separate class about the whole purpose, and this is an important class, the whole purpose of struggle and pain, about transforming, actually, transforming pain into purpose. 
taking pain and, transf and transforming it into purpose. What a trick. What a gift. Anyhow, so we have that. We were all created in B'Tselem Melokim, <laughs> in the image of God. We all have divine capacities. We don't even have a clue. And sometimes, the only time we have a clue, in fact, not sometimes, the only time we ever have a clue is when we are in those situations. That's when we have a clue. And then the last one, and I may have shared this in the context of one of my classes. If I did, Todd will let me know. <laughs> uh, no, he's here. He's front and center. Now, this is, uh, you've heard me talk about how Hebrew, which is described as Lashon Kadosh, the, the, holy, the holy tongue, right? That if you want to understand any reality, right, you reduce a Hebrew word to its shorish, to its root and you will find the essence of the thing. You will find the root of that thing, whatever it is, whatever emotion, whether it's love or rage or jealousy or a table or war. War is an amazing one. Maybe we'll get back to it. So you reduce the Hebrew word to its shorish, to its root, right? And you will see something that will expand your, your understanding of that thing. Okay. It's not true in other languages. Sometimes it's true. Sometimes it is true. So one of my daughters brought this, uh, this, this idea that I'm going about, about to share with you home from uh, one of her classes. And I, I just think it's a home run. So I'm going to share it with you. And it's also it's the fourth perspective that I consider a life-energizing perspective as we go through our lives. She noted that the word for Life in Hebrew is Chaim. And the word for life in English is? Good, good, beautiful. I always do that. It was a trick question. And everyone, everyone always pauses. Like, one second, what's he, where's he going with this? Okay, so it's life and Chaim, both four-letter words, right? So now we're going to look at the Shorish of Chaim, the root of Chaim, and we're going to look at the Shorish of life, even though this is not true about the Hebrew word, about the English word life. This is not the root, even though it, it, it appears in the middle but it's going to reveal something beautiful. How the Jewish, right, the Jewish perspective on life and a, or, or, or a spiritual perspective on life and a more secular mate, perhaps. Right in the middle of the word life are two letters, if, I, F. I'm alive if I have the house. I'm alive, I'm alive if I have the car. I'm alive if I have the job. That's not life. That's conditional life. I'm only alive, I'm only happy, I'm only fulfilled if, which means in the moment that you don't have those, while you're living without them, you're not fully alive. Because you're always struggling and striving for something that you don't have, believing that when you get that thing, you will be fully alive. If, look at the middle of the word for Chaim, for life. Yud, Yud, the two letters of God's name. And what she was saying is this, our perspective is you have everything at every given moment because God provides you with everything you need for every situation. You always have what you need. Instead of this perspective of always thinking that something else will really make a difference in my life, will really fulfill me and animate me and energize me, but what I'm in right now won't, isn't, I'm stuck. That's a major perspective to carry through life because it's something that everyone does, whether consciously or subconsciously. Would you agree on some level? Yeah. Are you troubled? No. no. Okay. I, I could hear you. I could hear you thinking. <laughs> I, I smelled the wood burn. Yeah, I smelled the wood burn. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't think that it is everything. Go ahead. I would argue that Life is conditional in a lot of ways. Mm. Uh, we talked about materialistic things. Right. Uh, love, that's not exactly materialistic, but job, house, yep. car. Yes. Fulfillment, satisfaction, true love. Yes. Uh, the ability to wake up every morning and say modani. Yeah. Isn't there something to life that is about saying, okay, this is something that I currently have not attained, not something material. Right. No, I get it. I, I know where you're going. I know where you're going. Good. That's a condition of life. So I don't think they're mutually exclusive. 
Okay. Well, you can, I, and this is what I mean. I'm glad you brought it up. Everyone heard the question, right? I, I was bringing up the examples I were I don't, bringing. I don't, I don't agree. You don't agree with him? I don't agree because there are, there are cultures and communities in Africa and places of the world who have never been exposed to modern conveniences Silence. that have no, there's no word or comprehension of despair or, or not having, that those are, those are modern white people's problems. I hate to say it that way, but that's what those- White privilege. Are. Those privilege <laughs> words those are, don't exist in the language. They, yes. They, they don't exist. And, um, and you can look at them and say, how in the world could they be happy? They have nothing. And in fact, they have everything they want and need, and maybe more, because there's no comprehension of- Of, of lacking. Of lacking. Of lacking. And so they, you're, and you're talking about people- pe are they're living more full lives than, than, well, than the others. I, 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 I hear you, but I'm not sure it contradicts anything. All you're stating is, is that if you remove if from the picture, the state of life is a life of, right, that's all. But, but many people live with if in their life. Oh, yeah. Right. So I'm talking to the people who live with if in their life. And we can have a, another discussion about whether it exists, even in those cultures where they don't have a name for it, or whether it still exists, or, or uh, we can have that conversation. But I'm talking about those that have if. Um, and if I you have anxiety. But if you have anxiety. With if, yeah. With if you have anxiety. Well, With if you have anxiety, yes. Yes, 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 yes. You could, you could, you could suggest that people that are, um, Massive accumulators yes. of whatever right. probably deal with more if in their lives oh. than any of them because they're constantly trying to compensate. <laughs> Why does somebody need 53 cars yeah. and an 85,000 square uh, foot house? I hear you. 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 Okay. I hear you. Dealing with this. Yes. Right, right. The Sultan of Brunei. I mean, Right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yes. Jealousy talk. Greg. As we, as yes. we go Everyone has challenges, and we all go through as, you know, just three words, you know, count your blessings. Right. Yeah, because, I mean, we all have, we all have our sores and our challenges and things. We have, you know, everyone has a story to tell, right? You know, and someone has you know, relative deprivation and, you know, things like that. But bottom line is as bad as things can be, it, it can always be worse. And you just count your blessings. Well, you know what, you, you say that, and I'm, I think everyone here, you're preaching to the choir. I think everyone agrees that, but it's not as easy as it sounds. It's, 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 it's just not as easy as it sounds to count your blessing. That is, because we have a tendency, you know what the hardest thing to see? The hardest thing to see? The, th the hardest thing to see is the, the, are the things that you see every day. You become blind to them. Mm -hmm. You see them every day, they're not, they're not there. Yeah, you take it for granted. You know, absolutely, but that's a phrase, but it's a real challenge to get there, absolutely. Okay, so those are, the, those are the perspectives. Now I want to share a couple of practices. Those are the perspective, life energizing perspectives that if we can remind ourselves of them on a daily basis, and by the way, we can't just know them. See, Torah isn't just about knowing. It's about reminding and it's about living. We can't rely on you know, some, some beautiful idea and beautiful wisdom that I, heard a, a, that I heard at a class that's gonna travel with me and I'm just gonna take it and it's always gonna be there and I'll be able to take it out. And it's not so easy. It needs to be nurtured until it's second habit. Can you send us a text every morning? <laughs> the JMI, JMI morning text. The morning text. Hi, this is Shlomo Seidenfeld. <laughs> this is your... Good morning. But it's a great idea, it's a great idea. By the way, they have these they have, there are several authors that offer daily wisdom. I mean, not only Torah daily offers. Affirmations. Daily affirmations. <coughs> Absolutely. Stuart Smalley. Stuart Smalley. Yes. Daily affirmations. Stuart Smalley. Okay. Who, what's his name? Stuart Smalley. Saturday Night Live. 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 Don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. Okay, fine. Yeah. Don't go there. Let's not go there. Right. Okay. Oh, oh, because of Ralph. Because of Ralph. Okay. Okay, so let's get into a three practice. I'm going to leave you three practices, things that you can do and incorporate. But consciously, you could just go over these. And maybe what I'll do is um, I'll create a, 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 a sheet, just a reminder sheet, and send it out. Right? The, what? Text. 
Text, not email? Not a text. I said text. Right. Did I say test? No. <laughs> Thank you. Text. This is a tough crowd. Tough crowd. Okay, so number one is this. Number one is this. Uh, and there, there are no chidushim over here, no revelations over here. But I don't know if this is part of your life. And I want to suggest that if you did incorporate this to some degree, and you have to have always have reasonable expectations, start, start, that it'll make a difference and it'll help you. Number one is prayer. But I'm not talking about having a sitter necessarily and opening up your sitter. And uh, although you certainly are welcome to do that and go to the Shema or go certainly to the Moda Ani, which is the prayer that we, open, that we started with. It's the first prayer in the morning, set the tone. There are prayers there, and thank God we have Art Scroll and we have other translation and commentary. I'm talking about, um, e e even if you don't do that, to have a verbal relationship with God. To pray to God, wherever you are, in whatever, in whatever language you choose. That when we go through, some, when we're experiencing something, whether we're hit with a wave of gratitude for something, a wave of blessing, or whether we're being severely challenged and we feel lost. And every, every experience in between. To literally like Tevya and Fiddler on the Roof who would stand off to the side, look up to God, and have a conversation. Because, because it's not enough. It's not enough to believe in God. What we want, <coughs> belief is not enough. Belief is not nearly enough. You know what, what, what's possible? What's possible is to have a relationship with God. Not only believe in it, but to have a relationship with God. Things are different. Have you noticed? It's not a co what, that when you feel something deeply, deeply, really deeply, um, it's, it's incredibly challenging to reduce to words, to convey it in words. I, I go through this every time I try to fill out a card on Mother's Day or, or on my anniversary. There's so much I want to say, and it, it just to condense it in a card is uh, impossible because it, it, it won't come close to conveying or capturing the depth of what I'm feeling. Verbalizing something, even something that doesn't come close, creates a relationship. It's very powerful. And I would urge everyone here on a daily basis to pray so that you don't only <coughs> believe in God, if you do, I take nothing for granted. It could be some people who are on the fence. It's a holy fence to be because there's some people that are on, not on the fence, right? To create a relationship with God, a real, real relationship with God. That's, how, that's what tefillah does for me. That's what prayer does for me. Yes? If this is too much of a tangent, I'll let you know. Answer, but is it better to pray by reciting prayers in Hebrew that you have memorized but don't understand, or to pray in English because that's the language that's that I great, understand? That's a great question. It's a great question. A great the question. answer is yes. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what I mean. I'll tell you what I mean. Um, there is a power. It's brought down that there is a power to Hebrew. And I'll tell you something. Sometimes I get so focused because I do understand Hebrew. And I do understand the prayers. And sometimes while I'm praying, the prayers themselves take me away from prayer. And I start thinking about the, philosophically what I can pull. And then I'm not praying anymore. There is a power to reciting something in Hebrew even if you don't understand it. However, prayer is so essential that um, if you're not feeling it, if the, if, the, if the motion and the experience is not fulfilling you, absolutely go to English or whatever language you want to go to. And then maybe do a little bit of Hebrew and in English. First of all, you'll, 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 you'll improve your skills, your Hebrew reading skills, right? And then maybe try to piece together and try to understand because now they have these translinear sidurims so that you can word by word, you can understand each word and slowly build up a vocabulary. So I would say that there is a power to, 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 to reading Hebrew, to, to praying in Hebrew. There's a power. Because, you know, first and foremost, I'll tell you, even if you don't understand, and this is something that came to me a while ago. Because prayer, by the way, is described. It's interesting. You want to hear one description of prayer? Warfare. It's warfare. How is it warfare? Because 
boom. I'm trying to focus on creating a relationship and everything and anything floats in front of my eyes. And I'm, I, I can be off in, in my business, I can be off in whatever tuition, I could be off in whatever in a split second. And before you know it, and especially for me who knows the, knows the prayers by heart, I'm going through it, but I'm not even praying. I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking about something else. It's warfare, it's hard. So prayer, ultimately, if I had to reduce prayer to one word, this would be my word, although I haven't really seen it. It would be longing. Prayer is longing. I want something. I want a connection. Actually, all, of, all learning should be longing also. Everything should be longing. Every mitzvah should be longing. Every mitzvah should be a vehicle in our minds to something deeper. But that's what prayer is. So I can long, I can pray in Hebrew, not focus, it's hard for me, not focus on, on what it means, and it's an experience of longing. I want a relationship, even if I don't understand. Having said that, understanding is crucial at the same time, right? And I would certainly say that, uh, that reading it and uh, um, um, praying in English should always be part of your experience, and I would add Hebrew as well. But if it would be just one or the other, it's never one or the other, but okay, yes. So there's, when you are reciting the prayer in Hebrew and thinking about the bill you have to pay or the this, is it just kind of like a background melody? Well, one second, I, I, I don't consciously go there. I understand. I don't consciously go. I'm saying it's always a threat. It's always a threat for me to be taken and whisked away to some other place, right? And I can just go through the words, right? And am, how, how affected am I? I don't know. All I'm saying is, is, is that, that there is a... The, the thrust of what I'm saying is, is that, that prayer, whatever language you're, even if you're, even if you are praying in a language that you're not familiar with, Hebrew, right? But you are filled, what's, what's moving you is this longing for this experience, you know, to be deep and spiritual, you can get something from that as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, but... The words have independent Absolutely. value. Absolutely. And I strongly urge you to, yeah, I strongly urge you. Prayer should absolutely be intelligible to you, but, I, but at the same time, right, there's a power even if, you, if, the, if, if you're not fully understand. So like, the, the way I would think of an answer to your question would be, in my layman's terms, is like music isn't only just a tune, it's also the lyrics and... Or it's not just the By the way, that's a great analogy. No, it's the opposite way. It's not the lyrics, it's the two. You have to say it the other way. The lyrics is the, are the words. Yes. Right. It's about the two. Yes, it's about the two. That's it. Because we were talking about understanding. The lyrics help you understand what exactly the musician is trying to convey. The, 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 it's accompanied by music, which is not quite as um, literal. Yeah, it is a great analogy. It's so a wonderful. Analogy is more, that was Mark Widower. Mark Widower, everyone. No, it's not a good. No, but I mentioned you. I shouted it out. Is that if right now somebody came into this room and sang a song, and I don't know how many of you know this, but there's a song called My State Labels, which is about uh -huh. somebody who. An old state. Okay, all right. You don't know what it says, unless you really speak Yiddish, but everybody in this room. Would feel. Would feel something. You don't know what the heck it's saying. Yeah, no, no, Yerushalayim. Right. Yeah. But my is very literal. I mean, th those the words just so. Yeah, like, it's, 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 it's a really, a, it's really an excellent analogy. It is. It's, it's really an excellent analogy. Okay, so prayer. I would strongly, strongly encourage on a daily basis. You know, it's not a coincidence that there are three prayer services every day. Shachus morning. Uh, well, it starts at night. The, the Jewish day begins at night. Mariv evening services. Shachus morning. Mincha. How many, how many meals does the average person have a day for the body? Three. Three, three square meals. Soul too. The soul can only go so long without. And of course, in between, we have blessings for food. We have blessings for a whole range of blessings. I actually want to do a, a special class just on blessings. I'd be there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm holding you. Mark Widower is coming. Okay, so, so prayer. Number two is what we're already doing. Is what we're doing right now? Learning. Learning. You know, it's interesting. Um, how long, um, how long can uh, the, the body go without eating solid food? 12, 12 days. 
Is that true? Oh, I thought it was less than that. 12 days? You can go 12 days before your organ? No, 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 it's not. No, 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 no. I thought it was seven. I thought it was seven. You think it's 12? You can be very good. Excuse me. Yes. You have liquid, but no food? Yes, liquid, but no food. At least a couple weeks, 12 days, 12 days. Okay, fine. Okay. How long can you go? How long can you go without water? Three days, roughly. How long can you go without air? Minutes. 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 And what, what that is conveying is, because air, breath, represents spirituality. You can go without, you can't go without it. On some level, you're in a distressed state, whether you realize it or not, if you don't have air in your, your, your if your soul doesn't have air in its, its lungs. It's distress. In a distress, it affects us. So prayer. Learning is the second. Learning. Um, on a daily basis. Talmud Torah, the learning, uh, the learning of Torah is something that can happen. N not true about all mitzvot, not true about prayer. Although you can break into prayer whenever, again, whenever you want to. We just discussed that. Talmud Torah is literally 24-7. 24-7 every day. There's only one day, really, that we, and it's, and, and it's coming up, that we're very, or one experience where we restrict the study of Torah. See if you can guess. Where we restrict not completely eliminate, where we restrict, Shabbat. what? Tishabav and another context, a shiva house. Oh, right, I both of them have to, in a house. oh, I, in an oh house. so I said restricted. I said restricted. In other words, okay. the Torah that you study there, really, should pertain to, right. Okay. You can't, okay. you know, a, a mourner should not just open up a Talmud and start learning Talmud, or open up a Chumash and start learning Chumash because there's a certain pleasure that comes with that, a deep soul pleasure. And the Torah wants, and the rabbis wanted us very, very focused to make sure that we heal and we process, right? So it limits the Torah that we can learn. Okay. So for instance, on Tisha B'Av, on Tisha B'Av, there are certain, there are certain Gemaras, there are certain, uh, there are certain Talmud um, um, sections that, that pertain to the destruction of the temple and to, and, and to, uh, and to tragedy. Those are appropriate. So Torah every day, Torah every day, whatever, whatever form it takes, whether you're studying the Torah portion, whether you're, 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 you're online and you find some, you know, uh, an, an article on, whatever form it takes for it to be, because this, the study of Torah is not only about experiencing God. This just came to me, by the way, as I, as I were, but not, not this moment, I mean earlier today. Um, the study of Torah is not only about experiencing God, right? And that's, Torah does do that, and, and prayer does do that, or accessing God. It's about discovering and accessing the godliness inside of us. That's what it's about. Accessing, pulling it, discovering it. That's what Torah study does. If you incorporate prayer, and then there's going to be a third, if you incorporate prayer and study every day, every day in our lives, those are two experiences that will strengthen our relationship with God and will give us, help us plug in to these perspectives that we, we talked about before. And then the third one is Shabbos. Shabbat. And I don't only mean the seventh day. I mean the entire week. And this is what I mean by that, because that sounds strange. That sounds strange. Just as an aside, by the way, there's a beautiful teaching that I heard that, uh, that um, conveys a, a very deep point. Um, Shabbos approached, this is obviously a, a, a sort of like a, a midrash, a, a teaching. Shabbos approached God and had a complaint. Shabbos approached God and had a complaint. This was the complaint. Every other day has a partner. Sunday has Monday. Tuesday has Wednesday. Thursday has Friday. I'm alone. Every other day has a partner. I'm alone. So what was God's answer? You're not alone. I gave you the Jewish people. I gave you the Jewish people. Shabbos is an experience, right? On some level, and again, we can discuss... You know, there are different degrees of observance. I, I get that. But for there to be a day where we step back, 
the example that I always use, which, which really resonates with me, is because I'm a big museum person. When I was living in New York, I moved here from New York. I used to go to the Metropolitan. You know the Met? The Met in New York. It's, it's just an amazing, amazing place. You used to go there all the time. And if you walk in, you can see, you can see Monet's, and you can see Monet was one of my favorites. And so you walk into one of these large rooms, and there are benches in the middle of the room. You sit in the bench, and you appreciate the art. You don't walk up to the art. You don't interact with the art. I mean, if you're an art student, art history student, maybe you do, you'll, you'll see something. You have to step back to see the picture. That's what Chavez is. You step back to see the picture, but it's much more than that. What I want to talk about, everyone fo when, when we talk about Shabbos, everyone focuses on the day of Shabbos. You know what we don't focus on? The week before Shabbos. The Pasuk, the verse says, Sheshes yamim tavod, six days, this is a command, Six days, sheishes yamim talvod vasisa komalachtecha. Six days you should work and finish and complete all of your work, your designs, and rest on the seventh day. We're supposed to be busy. We're supposed to be using during the week. It's a mitzvah to be using our creative abilities, God-given creative abilities. It's divine. It's part of the way we emulate God, by, being, by using our creative faculties during the week. And then on Shabbos, we're reminded about the bigger picture, and we're reminded to use those creative faculties right, for other purposes, not only our own self, selfish purposes. To take whatever we do, whatever gifts we've been given, and by gifts I don't only mean, again, faculties, but experiences that prepare you you know, grief could be a powerful experience. It makes you acutely aware of the pain of others. I hate to say, say get, uh, grief is a, is a gift, but it can be something that, that you use. So we're talking about Shabbos as a day where you stand back and take stock and really, you know, and, and even though the laws of Shabbos sound extreme, I get it, totally, totally get it. I'm not here to push, some, you know, push you into an orthodox um, observance of Shabbos. What I am pushing, what I am strongly encouraging, is there should be a weekly. See, the other two are, the other two are daily. Prayer is daily. Torah daily, 24-7. This is weekly. And the more that something happens, that means, that means clearly, it's clear that that experience is an experience that we need more frequently. Yom Kippur comes once a year. Rosh Hashanah once a year. Sukkot once a year. Shabbos, every week. We can't go a week without it. We're in distress if we don't, if we're just on the wheel and we're going from... There is, a, um, there is a beautiful teaching that I saw, and I believe I'm going to quote him because I think it's him. I'm not positive. Samson Rafal Hirsch, uh, a rabbi, Samson Rafal Hirsch, who notes the language of Havdalah when we're saying goodbye to Shabbos, right? Are we all familiar with that? With the candles and the fragrance, right? And the wine and the, and, and the cup is spilled over. So he notes, here's the language the, in the blessing. Baruch hamavdil ben kodesh lecho. Blessed is the, is the one who distinguishes between that which is holy, kodesh, and cho. What would you say if, if we're making a distinction, what would you say chol means? If we're making a distinction between something that is holy, chol must be unholy. unholy. That would be the natural. That, he said that, that's not right. Shabbos is holy. The rest of the week is not holy. Not at all. He says, you know what chol means? You know what we're doing? We're making a distinction between that which is holy and that which is not yet holy. You know what the week's about? taking something that's not yet holy and infusing it with holiness. <clears throat> this commitment to take our faculties, to take our abilities, not, not just hole up and you know, run from, 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 you know, from one uh, tzedakah to the next tzedakah, to all that, but to live our lives in a holy way, to conduct our businesses in a holy way, to conduct our relationships, to conduct war in a holy way. To manage a portfolio in a holy way. And when we're making Havdalah, you know what we're doing? We're making Kiddush, right? We make Kiddush when, we, when, we end, when Shabbos comes in. 
We're sanctifying the day. You know what we're doing when we make Avdalah? What are we making Kiddush on? The week. The week. That's what we're doing. And we're singing Bimbam. Right? Bimbam. Bimbam's a big part. <laughs> Those are the three practices I want to, that I think can be transformative. That's a strong word. I believe it. Can be transformative. If you pray every day, if you study every day, by prayer, longing, introspection, you learn every day, and you have Shabbos in your week, every week on some level, and we can discuss that, what forms that can take so that it'll be meaningful. You're, I'm telling you, all the perspectives that we mentioned, and of course, plugging into those perspectives consciously, huge difference in your life, huge. Yes, Mark. Um, something that we've been, that I've been doing for the last several months, inspired by our trip and also by my son, who's more observant than I, um, is I, I've just decided not to work on Saturdays. And, and I used to work whenever I needed to work. I yeah. To speak louder. Oh, he wants you to speak louder. Okay. So I used to uh, just work whenever I needed to work, including on Saturdays. But I just decided I'm not going to work on Saturdays. And and and. What I really want to do is I just want to stay home and be with family. And I'm not, I don't abstain from electronics and yes. stuff, but, uh, or, or. True confessions. Say, so, pardon me? True confessions. Yeah. No, 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 I understand. I understand. I but, yeah. but, um, but I don't work anymore. Right. And I enjoy my family and I'm with them and that's it. And, but I, sometimes I'm drawn away by other things and I find that when that happens, <coughs> I am in distress, literally. I mean, that word applies entirely. I'm, I'm so calmed and mellowed simply by abstaining from all of the work and, um, and being with my, my family that when I don't have that, I'm, there's something wrong. And, and I, 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 so I what, want to acknowledge the word. So when you experience something, when you have an authentic experience that gets into your, as we say, Ralph, you'll love this, kishkas, when it gets into your kishkas, when it gets into your kishkas, and you have an authentic experience, that when you move away from that, you feel it palpably. That's well, what you're when saying. You miss it for the when you miss it, right, when you don't have it in your life, you miss it palpably. Yeah. It's longing again. Yeah, yeah. It's longing, it's longing, right, it creates a longing. So again, Tonight's subject was how to, how to stay vibrant, how to stay vibrant and vital, even as, you know, and for me, this is, for me and for some of us, you know, as we're getting older, we're feeling our mortality, we're, we're feeling our knees, we're feeling, I'm making noise when I get up from a chair, never used to do that before, right? You mean like, yeah, uh, whatever. That's some, but to know that no matter what state we're in, that we have plug-ins. We have plugins, and there are things that we can incorporate in our lives, right, that will help put everything into perspective, give us a framework, give us experiences. Um, and and I, I, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of, 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 of each of these. This is, my, this is a prescription, my, this is the Torah's prescription. This is the Torah's prescription. Not exclusively, every mitzvah is part of this. Every mitzvah is you know, provides that uh, on some level. Okay, this was wonderful. Thank you so much, Ralph. I think that you can kill it. Wait, wait. Applause. Yeah, okay, applause. Thank you, thank you. We got the applause, that's great, great. You good? Good. Sign off. This is Shlomo Seidenfeld signing off. <laughs> good night. Good night, and good Jews. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. May the